good to have everybody tuned in to us here for another Sunday morning broadcast uh, for the whole street congregation. We're so glad that you're tuned in, and we hope and trust that you're having a, a great uh, holiday season, and we pray that God continue to bless and keep you. I'm so thankful to God uh, for all those who have been ill that he's brought back to a greater portion of health and strength, and we want to say we are so thankful to God for that. And uh, we're thankful to God that we seem to have some means of being able to eradicate uh, this coronavirus. So we're thankful to God for that. We also want to thank all those who may not be members here that are tuning in. As always, we're so appreciative for you tuning in to the broadcast. And we'd love for you to come out and be with us at our Sunday morning drive-in worship service each Sunday morning at 9 a.m., We'd love for you to come out and be with us. We have a full-fledged worship service each Sunday morning, 9 a.m., here at the Whole Street Congregation in the parking lot. So we'd love for you to come out and be with us. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd like you to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. The chapter is 5, and we'll read verse 20. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 20. Paul writes, Now then... We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled. And that's the subject matter that we want to look at for the next two Sunday mornings. Be ye reconciled. Now, let us look at this together and understand just what reconciliation means when it comes down to what we're looking at on this these two particular lessons we'll be looking at a uh, divinity and humanity in reconciliation and later on if it be the Lord's will we'll look at humanity and humanity reconciling with one another so as we look at the Apostle Paul we sometimes wonder what kept the Apostle Paul going what caused Paul to keep on keeping on. Well, Paul had a lot of trouble in his life. If you'll turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the chapter is 4, and let's look at some of the things that went on in Paul's life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he talks about this. He says, we are troubled, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 8. He said, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Christ's sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that the he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us by Jesus and shall present us with you, he says. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving may redound to the glory of God. For which cause? We faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh us for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So Paul says that they were troubled on every side. They were persecuted, not forsaken. They were cast down. Paul had problems in his life. What kept Paul going? Go with me to 2 Corinthians, the chapter is 11. 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, verse number 24. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. Paul talks about the things that he went through. He says of the Jews, five times 
received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, and thrice I suffered shipwreck. Night and a day I've been in the deep, and journeys often, in perils of water, perils of, of robbers, perils of my own country, and perils in the heathens, perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, and watching offers, and hunger and thirst, and fastings often, and cold and nakedness. And beside all things, those things that come upon me daily is the care of all other churches. Then he talks about another event where they had a contract out on Paul's life. In verse 33, he says, and through a window, he says, in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped by his hand. Now, Paul talks about what happened in Acts chapter 22, we find. Him going to, in, in Acts 9, uh, excuse me, I want you to turn that with me to Acts chapter 9, and then we'll go over uh, to Acts 22. But he talks about this event that happened in Acts chapter 9, being let down in the basket. And I really want to uh, iterate this point. They had a contract out on Paul's life. In Acts 9 and 20, after Paul's conversion, it says, in, uh, in straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he's the son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on the name uh, uh, in his name in Jerusalem and came thither for the intent that he might bring them bound into the chief priest? Now, Paul was persecuting Christians, and so they was trying to figure out how in the world could this man have changed like this. Now he's speaking out for Christ, and he was against Christ. But Saul, verse 22 increased more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying in wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. They stayed up day and night to make sure that Paul didn't get away. They wanted to kill him. And verse 25, and the disciples took him by night and led him down in a, a basket, in, in a wall, in a basket. So here's a man that had a hit out on his life. Then in Acts chapter 20, verse 22 through 27, he was going bound to Jerusalem. And notice what he says, Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 20, I'm sorry. Verse 22 through 27. And now I behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, save the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. Paul went through a lot in his life. He said, but none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of of God. Paul wanted to preach the gospel and he did regardless of all the things that he went through. What kept Paul going? Look at Acts 14. Acts the 14th chapter. And verse number 19. Acts 14 and verse number 19. Let's, we're looking at some things that he went through. And I want to show you one of the reasons, major reasons why Paul kept on going. And this should keep us going when we are in Christ Jesus. Acts 14 and verse number 19. And there came there the certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead. How be it? As the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Now, I want you to notice what Paul did. Notice verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel of that city and taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, and Antioch. This man went back to the place among the people that had stoned him and left him for dead to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. What kept Paul going? The mission, the message, the purpose, the passion 
for Christ. Paul saw the mission of Christ greater than himself. So Paul lost sight of himself. Now, what is one of the greatest reasons that he stayed the course? And the reason I brought all that out, because he knew something, and that's something that we need to know as Christians that should keep us going. I want you to go back to our text in 2 Corinthians, the chapter is 5, and verse number 20. And he talks about, in our subject matter, is be ye reconciled. Now, I want you to see something. Paul kept going because he knew that he had been reconciled to God. Now, we need to look at this word, reconciliation, this morning. What does it mean to reconcile or to be reconciled? Well, let's give a definition of the word reconcile. Reconcile means to restore friendly relations between, to cause to coexist in harmony, to make or to show to be compatible, to settle or to resolve differences. Now, let's think about Paul for a minute. Was Paul ever at odds with God? Yes, indeed. But he realized that he was no longer at odds with God when he obeyed the gospel, that he had been reconciled to God. So he's pleading, he's beseeching, he's begging for people to be reconciled to God, to get back in friendly relations with God. So out of all those things that he was going to, Paul knew that God was and he and God had been reconciled to one another. He had become friends with God. Now, here's the deal. Let's look at this for just a second. I want you to look at how many times he mentioned this word in this text. So to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 18 beginning. And all things are of God who hath reconciled. Mark that in your Bible. Reconcile us to himself. By Jesus Christ. God has made friends with us or reconciled with us to himself by Christ Jesus. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Mark that in your Bible. Then there's the ministry of reconciliation. We've got to be teaching people that's our job. To let them know that you are enemy to God. You need to be reconciled to God. To wit. To wit what? Just what he's talked about in verse 18, to wit, that God was in Christ. Get this again, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing unto them their trespasses. So here's the deal. God did not impute the trespasses, and we'll look at that later on in the lesson, because now we've been reconciled. Then he says, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So we got to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the word of reconciliation. It is what has to be obeyed in order for men to obey it and they will become reconciled or no longer the enemies of God. What kept Paul going? He understood this word reconciliation. Now I want you to see this. Everyone that is an enemy of God is and will always be fighting a losing battle. That's why in our text, Paul wants us to know in verse 20 of 2 Corinthians 5, be ye reconciled. Why? You cannot fight against God and win. The psalmist says in Psalm 92 in verse number 9, For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, For lo, thine enemy shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. Now I want you to notice what the proverbial writer says in Proverbs 21 and verse number 30. And let us get this and let us understand the meaning of what the proverb writer is saying. 
Proverbs 21, 30 says, there is no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel against the Lord. Let's read that verse again. There is no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel against the Lord. What do you mean? Anybody who goes against God is a foolish person. Why? There's no wisdom in that. There's no counsel that can show you how to defeat God. That shows you that understanding here and that there is no counsel against God. There's no understanding and counsel against God. So what are we saying? You got to be reconciled to God because you cannot fight against God and win. Remember the great teacher of the law, Gamaliel, when the apostles, Peter and the apostles were down and he spoke uh, about the things that they were saying and he, he made a grand statement and they listened to Gamaliel because he was a respected man, a man of great reputation among the Jews. And if you'll turn me to Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39, it says, and now I say unto you, refrain from these men. They wanted to do them some harm and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. It, it, it'll, it, it'll fail. It won't be anything. Don't worry about it. Verse 29, verse 39, Acts 5, 39. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. What is he saying? Leave these men alone. If what they're doing is not of God, it's going to fail. If it's of God, it's going to prosper, and there's nothing that you could do about it because you don't want to find yourself fighting against God because if you do, you're going to lose every single time. I want you to go back to 2 Corinthians, the chapter 5. Be ye reconciled. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians. The chapter is 5. And let's look at this together a little closer. Paul wants us to know something. So now he talks about, I show you five times where we see this word reconciled or reconciliation or ministry of reconciliation. We got reconciled. We got the ministry of reconciliation in verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 5. We got Reconciling the world to himself in the word of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5 and 19. And we got be ye reconciled to God in 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Now let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5 in verse number 17. And therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So now we see because of this reconciliation, we see this man as a new creature in Christ. He's been reconciled to God. He's a new person. He's a new creature. His attitude, his character, his conduct has changed. And now when we go into 2 Corinthians chapter 6, which is a continuation of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse number 1, we then, as workers together with him, beseech Ye also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, why? We can work together, and they were to work together, because they all had been reconciled unto God. Therefore, they could be together. And when we talk about, in future lessons, in future weeks, Lord willing, we're talking about today, divinity and humanity reconciliation. But then we're going to talk about humanity and humanity reconciliation. And we'll look at the steps of that. But until there's reconciliation, until friendship is brought back or together, we are not going to be able to work together. We can't be work with God and we be alienated from God. We got to be reconciled to God 
And even if we are call, of our, call ourselves working for God and we haven't been reconciled to God, then we're not really working for God. Many people would say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and thy name done many wonderful works? But he said to you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. We, because they hadn't been reconciled to God. Be ye reconciled. Now, let's look at the implication of reconciliation. We want to look at the implication of reconciliation. Here we are. Implied in reconciling or bringing back together, by implication and by inference, we have to know in order for reconciliation to take place, that someone has been separated. So, we are showing that it's naturally understood for that to be reconciliation, that there had to be separation. And we define reconciliation. We find the meaning of reconciliation. To restore friendly relations between. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Our iniquities have separated us between us and our God, and he will not hear. The Greek word, uh, sin here, homotia, or the missing of the mark. And all of us have missed the mark with God. How do we know that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we got to be reconciled to God. Now, following... The separation, there comes alienation. So after separation, we get alienation. Listen to what Paul says concerning the Gentile Christians uh, who have become Christian in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 21. Colossians 1 and verse number 21. And you that was sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked work, yet now he hath reconciled. The Colossian Christians were alienated from God and enemies from God in their mind, but when they obeyed the gospel of Christ, they were reconciled, brought back into friendly relations with God. So after separation, that is alienation. And because of alienation, some terrible things and some terrible losses happen in our life. Go with me to Ephesians. The chapter is 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And listen to Paul. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 17. Listen to what he says. Beginning at verse 17. Ephesians 4 verse 17 through verse 19. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles in the vanity of their mind. Notice verse 18. Having the understanding darkened, get this, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness, that's all sorts of lewd acts, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, what do we find here? They were alienated from the life of God. Now, what does that really mean? What is a man's state if he's alienated from the life of God? Friend, we are living in a dead world. Why do we say that? So many people are living, existing every day, not reconciled to God, and are walking dead men and women. Why? Because they have not been reconciled. And, and why is that such a terrible thing? Because God has made the reconciliation possible through Jesus Christ. So now we notice this. Remember the story in Luke 15 of the prodigal son? He was living a good life in the perspective of the world, from the perspective of the world. But in his father's eyesight, he was dead. His father knew he was lost. He was a walking dead man. In Luke 15 and 32, 
the father explains to the oldest son why there was rejoicing. And the text says in Luke 15, 32, and it was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this. Thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. What happened? That son went into the far country of sin, came back, repented of his sin, reconciled back to the father. And now there's friendly relations between the father and the son. How can we be reconciled to God? We'll look at this even further. We got to hear the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believe with all of our heart, Hebrews 11 and 6. Repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess Christ as the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32. And be baptized for the remission of sin, Acts 2, verse number 38. And the Lord will add us to the church. And we will have been reconciled unto God. And if we live faithfully unto death, God will give us a crown of life. Let us commemorate the reconciling action, greatest thing known to man, how God reconciled us back to him through the person of Jesus Christ as we celebrate each Lord's Day, the communion with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 26, Matthew 26 and verse number 26. The Bible says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, break it, and gave thanks unto the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Let us give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this dinner, the bread which represents the body of your son, Jesus Christ, the perfect one who came and died for the sins of all mankind. May we take it with clean hands. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of, my, uh, uh, of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink his fruit of this fruit of the vine until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that ran down on Calvary's cross we might be reconciled to you, dear God. We're so thankful. For we realize without the shedding of his blood, there would be no remission of sin. There would be no reconciliation. As we take it, may we remember this great sacrifice. In Jesus' name we do pray and ask it all. When they had sung a hymn, they went out on the Mount of Olives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for another beautiful day. We thank you, dear God, for your power and your grace to reconcile a lost and sinful world back to you. And we thank you for that in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we do pray and ask it all.